Welcome to Fundamentals of Fluid Mechanics. In this introductory video, we're going to introduce a few key concepts of the study of fluid mechanics. At the end of this video, you should be able to identify the key characteristics and properties of fluids, understand the concept of viscosity and surface tension, list the important dimensions and units of physical quantities, and classify different types of fluid flows. Fluid mechanics is a broad discipline concerned with the mechanics of fluids. So fluids are gases, liquids, and plasmas. Furthermore, fluid mechanics is interested in the forces acting on these fluids. It investigates phenomena in nature and the engineered world. So in nature, these are ubiquitous, such as in the atmosphere, cardiovascular flows, weather predictions, atmospheric turbulence, and the interaction between at the atmosphere and marine flows. Fluid mechanics is also fundamental to numerous engineered systems. For example, an internal combustion engine deals with fluid mechanics and the combustion of the fluids within it. Furthermore, we see fluid mechanics uh, in airplanes, such as external aerodynamics, turbines for power generation, HVAC systems, so heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, and in the oil and gas industry as well. Before we continue any further, we should probably answer the question, well, what is a fluid? Fluids encompass both liquids and gases. Solids have densely, densely spaced molecules and therefore large intermolecular forces, whereas fluids have molecules spaced farther apart. Gases have even further molecular spacing than liquids. A gas, if placed in a container, will com completely fill the volume of that container. One of the most distinguishing features of fluids is their reaction to a shear stress. A fluid differs from a solid in how it responds to a shear force. So over here, imagine we have some sort of material, whether it is a solid or liquid or gas, it doesn't matter at this point. And it is being acted upon by a shear force, F. If the material is a solid, a constant shear force will result in a static deflection. That is, a small deformation may occur, but the material will not continuously deform. A fluid, on the other hand, will continuously deform, and this is what we call flow. Furthermore, a shear stress is proportional to a shear strain. And you would have seen this if you have studied uh, mechanics of materials. On the other hand, for a fluid, a shear stress is proportional to the, to the shear strain rate. So math mathematically, what we would say is, for a solid, the shear stress is proportional to the shear strain, this for a solid, and for a fluid, the shear stress is proportional to the shear strain rate. And that little dot above it means that this is a time derivative of um, the shear strain. The details of this at this moment do not really matter. Right now we just want to establish uh, the differences between a fluid and a solid. We will get into the mathematics much later. In our study of fluid mechanics, we can treat the fluid as a continuum. Again, you may have seen this in your study of mechanics of materials. 
The continuum hypothesis supposes that the substance can be divided into smaller and smaller pieces ad infinitum. That means forever. That is, we can continuously subdivide an element of fluid or solid forever. We can always divide it in half, for example. But what about atoms and molecules? Continuum mechanics predates the acceptance of atomic theory. Although we now know that the continuum hypothesis is fundamentally false, it does remain a useful approximation. At large scales, fluids do indeed behave as predicted by assuming them to be continua. For example, a gas at a normal temperature and pressure will have molecular spacing on the order of 10 to the negative 6 millimeters. However, the number of molecules per cubic millimeter is on the order of 10 to the power of 18. Thus, it is hopefully evident that in a very small volume, the number of molecules is huge and the idea of using average values at a point, that is over this tiny volume, is still reasonable. Below is a list of common fluid properties with some cursory descriptions. We'll formalize all of these as we move through this course. So some of the most important fluid properties include the density, the pressure, viscosity, and compressibility. So you probably already have an idea of what each of these means. So the density is formally the mass per unit volume. So how much mass is there in a given uh, volume of space? Pressure is a normal force per unit area. It is always acting inward or towards um, a solid surface, for example. Viscosity is the tendency of a fluid to resist shear. Stated differently, this is the resistance of a fluid um, against flowing, okay? So the tendency of a fluid to resist shear. So shear induces flow. So if it is a highly viscous fluid, then it will try to resist this flowing motion. So you can think of honey, for example, is a highly viscous fluid, whereas water or air have, have a much lower viscosity. Compressibility is the tendency of a fluid to change volume. under pressure. Okay, so some fluids, when they experience a pressure change, will maintain their volume, whereas others, um, they will compress or expand. So in practice, air is assumed to be compressible. But this is not always true. There are some um, situations where air is considered incompressible uh, to a fairly uh, good level of accuracy. Water, on the other hand, is often assumed to be incompressible. That is, it will resist changing its volume under, uh, under pressure or differences in pressure. In addition to these, in fluid mechanics, we're also going to be interested in some kinematic properties such as velocity and acceleration, which you know quite well by now. 
So these are the main fluid properties that we will consider in this course, although there will be others that we will um, introduce as we move forward. The many fluid characteristics we will encounter require an adequate quanti quantitative description. Typically, quantities will be described using both a number and a standard by which the quantities can be compared. So this standard, or the standard of measurement, is called a unit. All units can be described as combinations of mass, length, and time. These three are called basic dimensions, or primary quantities. An additional primary quantity, which is sometimes of importance, particularly in fluid mechanics, is temperature. So the unit is the standard of measure measurement, and you're probably aware of a few such as the SI system of units, or imperial. So the basic dimensions of mass, length, and time can be expressed in different uh, systems of units. For example, length can be expressed in feet or inches, or it can be expressed in mass, in uh, meters or kilometers. These basic dimensions are very important and will play a central role in our later study of dimensional analysis. With these primary quantities, we can describe secondary quantities, which are sometimes referred to as derived quantities. These are combinations of the primary or basic dimensions. I've included a few from a very long list that are quite common in uh, fluid mechanics. For example, acceleration in SI units is meters per second squared. So meters is a length, so we uh, indicate that we have an L here, per second squared. Um, so uh, second squared, uh, that's a time, uh, to the negative two. Angles in radians, uh, for example, uh, do not have any um, uh, dimensions. A volume is a dimension of length to the power of three. And forces, as we know, is uh, equal to the mass times the acceleration. So we have a mass, and an acceleration is a length, a distance, divided by um, uh, time squared. So mlt to the negative two. The next important concept is that of dimensional homogeneity. Dimensional homogeneity might seem a bit straightforward, but it is, it is of utmost importance in fluid mechanics. Strictly speaking, dimensional homogeneity means that all terms of an equation um, must have the same dimensions. That is, we are adding apples to apples and not apples to oranges. In other words, the left-hand side must be equal to the right-hand side, and every term on every side, on each side, must have the same dimensions. Now why is this important? There are many forms of the same um, equations of fluid mechanics. So for example, Newton's second law can be expressed in many different forms in the study of fluids. And so it's very important to make sure that the dimensions are agreeing not only between the left-hand side and the right-hand side, but also uh, between each terms.